Okay, I am going to show you our big quarter project that we're going to be doing. So here at the beginning of the quarter, I've been giving you lots of assignments that are worth like five points, 10 points, participation points, trying to get you like into the swing of school. Um, so if you have been late on those or you've missed a couple and you're still you're going to be late on them. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, get those assignments in. They're not nothing, but I wouldn't be as stressed because we're kind of ramping things up. And the ultimate goal of this quarter is to write a first draft of this essay coming up called the braided essay. And that assignment, it says 50, that assignment will be worth a hundred points. Um, so it's kind of like, you can kind of see how things like balance out in the class. Um, so, there are all these lights going on. Um, so I uh, am going to show you this. Let me share. Okay, so this is the assignment. You can always access this on Canvas. It's due October 4th, nope, 5th for you guys, I think. Um, one of those days. And here's the assignment. So it's called a braided essay. So what you're doing with this is you are choosing for this particular one, you're choosing two topics to write about. One is your big moment. That's the heart of your essay. That is the, that is like the whole point of the essay is to illustrate something about your life, some sort of like big change that you had. Um, and that could be, again, that could be just like a mindset change. It could be a change in your circumstances. Um, you know, we've had a kid, Mrs. Plummer does this assignment too. And we've had a kid write about like how his family, um, how his dad got remarried. And so he had like, you know, new family members and dealing with that, which I think is a pretty big event. But then she has also had somebody write about somebody having, uh, standing in a long line at Disneyland, which is a pretty small event. It's not like anything momentous happened in that line. It was just that person talking about that, that moment in their life. So there's this wide spectrum. Um, you are gonna choose one of those moments to expand on. Then you are going to write a three page long paper where you tell that story and you are telling it like a story. So it's like, you get to take a lot of narrative experiments here. Like you could use dialogue, you could do it in um, a different kind of narrative voice. You could get really poetic with the language. However, you want to tell that story that you think conveys what that experience was like for you. So here it says, um, you may write about a relationship loss, a story from your life, something you're working through, section of this paper should have all elements of good narrative writing. So it should be something that I enjoy reading um, and that your peers would enjoy reading. Um, as far as like it being personal to you, I will be reading it and then you'll have to do a peer review with it. And you can choose who you'd want to peer review it. And so you can kind of choose to share it with a friend if you wanted to, um, but just keep that in mind when you're deciding what you want to write about, because you might want to keep some things private. Um, and then the second part of the essay is writing a two page long research paper. And you're going to braid these two things together and they should be informing each other. So the research paper is really like what the transcendentalists did, where they kind of look at the natural world or they look at the world around them and they see some objective reality about that world around them. This is how, this is what dolphins are like. This is what uh, welding is like. This is how a grocery store is set up. You know, it could be, this is what Rosa Parks's life was. It can be like some sort of like objective thing that you can research about and you're gonna write a two page long research paper. And the way you choose that is you look at your personal story and you think what kind of like thing out there in the world would help people understand and help me understand the significance of this story. So that same kid who wrote about like his family sort of coming together and getting new family members with stepbrothers and stepsisters, his research paper was about welding and how like the scientific process about what happens when you weld two metals together. So you can see how this story about welding could inform the story about what happened to him with his, when his dad got remarried. So um, I want this one to have in-text citations and a works cited page. I know that you guys did MLA last year because uh, you, you either had me as your teacher or you had 
Maybe ovary as your teacher, you had shirtless as your teacher. We all collaborated. So I know you've all done MLA. And so you know how to do in-text citations in a works cited page. You'll need a couple citations for this because I want to show that you're actually doing some research. You know the facts here. And when you first turn this in as a first draft, you're going to turn these in separately. So here's my personal paper. Here's my research paper. And then over the course of like the next month or so, we're going to work on how to braid those together so that you'll have small sections of each and you'll take page breaks and they will inform each other. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So far, do you have any questions? So if I were doing this, actually, I, I really am going to do this with you. Um, I'm going to write about that pair story. And I, so what happened was I was a, not the best kid. I wasn't like the worst kid, but I wasn't the best kid. And uh, I had, I, I was kind of like a, a punk kid, whatever punk meant in the 90s. That's what I was. So we snuck out at about two in the morning and we went to a 24 hour grocery store. And I don't know, we were just dumb and didn't think about other people. And we were throwing pears at each other without buying them. Um, and the manager came over and started yelling at us. And we were terrified because we were like, again, bad kids, but not that bad of kids. So we were like, we're going to be in so much trouble. And he was threatening to call our parents um, to come get us at two in the morning. We were out past curfew. He was threatening to call the cops. It was really scary. And then ultimately he just decided, uh, whatever, just go home. And so we were able to go home and I like could live my life without, I can still go to the Macy's grocery store. Like I still feel I, I you know, didn't get in trouble. My parents still don't know that story um, and everything was good. So I would write about that instance. And then I think because of like who we were as kids, I think I would do the research paper about the history of punk. So I'm going to go back to like the 1970s and look at punk rock as a music movement and write a little research paper on how punk rock became a thing. So in my instance, like it's a memory I'm fond of and I like thinking about. So that'll be fun to write. And then the research paper part is something I'm very interested in too. So that'll be fun to write. So I kind of want it to be something that like you have real, um, like you really want to write about it basically um, because we're going to be submitting these to a writing contest. I'm going to make you submit it. It's the scholastic writing contest. Usually, so they have like about 20,000 usually submissions in a year and they give away about 3000 prizes. So, I mean, the odds are pretty good that we'll have some people even win the writing contest and it'll be an awesome thing to put on a resume or if you're applying for Sterling Scholar or um, just all sorts of things. It's awesome to be able to say you won a writing, uh, writing contest. And just so you're aware, it's gonna be a $10 submission fee. So, and you'll have to, you'll have to pay the $10 submission fee. But that's nothing for, you know, how you're going to win. I think only a few people actually win prize money in this contest, and it's like $500. So it's not, you know, the most lucrative contest to win, but it's still exciting. <laughs> and we'll be doing that. We'll be submitting them in November. So we're working on this for a long time. It's not what we'll be working on in class the whole time. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we'll really get this first draft down. And then um, after that, you'll be kind of on your own, uh, turning in drafts and so on. What are your questions? Any questions? Are you sort of understanding what the assignment's going to look like? Okay, let's do word of the day then, where our word of the day goes with this. Yeah. Um, you'll have a couple days, like we'll have a day where we're workshopping it and then you'll have a day where you're peer reviewing it where you'll do some stuff in class, but not a lot. Okay, you got your word of the day sheet out. Almost. Today it's lyric. Oh, you guys still have space. Okay, good. All right, you ready? I'm just going to read the definition to you. So we're thinking about the poetic definition of lyric, which is a poem that expresses the writer's emotions. 
poem that expresses the writer's emotions, typically in the first person. Poem that expresses the writer's emotions, typically in the first person. Poem that expresses the writer's motions, typically in the first person. So it's a genre of poetry. I know a lyric can mean a lot of different things. Like a lyric in music is different, you know, but it's a genre of poetry. So in poetry, you've got limericks and haiku and elegies, which is about dead people usually, and odes, and there's all different kinds of poems. Um, this is a specific kind of poem where the writer is like having this like emotional outburst. <laughs> That's basically what a lyric is. And probably it's the most familiar kind of poem because whenever you think of poetry, you're thinking of like emotions and, and the, that, that kind of thing, but it's not necessarily true for all poems. Um, so the example, I'm gonna take it right from Annie Dillard because even though she's not writing a poem, I think she's got some lines that are very lyrical and it says, I would like, to live as I should, as the weasel lives as he should. Remember last time when we were reading about weasels? Like to live as I should, as the weasel lives as he should. All right, not like the most emotional, you know, this isn't a, a poem about her most recent breakup, but I think this should, sort of shows how the transcendentalists were interested in the lyric or the lyrical. So I would like to live as I should, as the weasel lives as he should. All right, tell me this, why does she use this phrase should? Why doesn't she say, I would like to live as the weasel, like the weasel? Instead she says, I would like to live as I should. Okay, so they are separate purposes. I like that. Jack, were you going to add to that? Oh, uh, yeah, kind of like she doesn't want to live exactly what the weasel does. She wants to live as like what she should be doing, like how the weasel does exactly what she should be doing. Okay, good. So part of this is about if it's a transcendental idea, copying is like the absolute opposite of what you should be doing. Yeah, Keegan. Um, so when she said I should kind of wish that she had like the divine purpose in life. Yeah, why does it why does it have that <clears throat> feel to it? Um she's just saying that like she should like I don't know how to explain it. Like that's what she was born to do basically. Yeah. And she should live out that right, I guess. Yeah, it kind of frames it as a kind of responsibility. Like she says, I would like to live as I should. So there's this part where it's like, this is what I would desire to do for myself, right? But it's also about tapping into something more than just her whims in the moment. It's about like finding that one thing that she really wants to go towards. Awesome. I think you guys did a great job. Here's what I want you to write about under effects. Why does it make sense um, in a transcendental essay to focus on the writer so much. So I'm going to say this. Why is this sentence transcendental? And you're going to write that down under effects. What about the construction of the sentence as well as the idea makes it transcendental?
And then when you're done, you're going to find in your packets the essay called A Braided Heart. It's the very last one. Blue on blue, that probably doesn't show up that way. Oh, sorry, last one in the white pages. Sorry about that. So there's like a little partial essay at the very end of the white pages, but it's the last full essay in the white pages. And then if you need a packet for today, I've got extras on the back table. So Luke, you need one, JJ, you need one, you can just borrow one. Just don't write in it. Okay, here's what we're going to do with this. I am going to um, have you read this silently to yourself. It's kind of a longer essay. So in about five minutes, I'm going to check in. We're going to do a little bit of discussion wherever you are. And we'll do that until you're done reading the essay. So you're reading silently to yourself. It's, it's your packet, if it is your packet. It's your packet, so you can write on it. And I want you to notice how she's using metaphors in this. So as you're, as you're going through, it's not like I want tons of annotations, but kind of underline where you think the metaphor is important. Okay, any questions? Awesome, then I will check in in about five minutes. Okay, after they read the braided essay, I just had them brainstorming about what they think they're going to write about. So for about five minutes, I want you to just on a piece of paper, brainstorm some ideas for your braided essay. And that includes both parts, both the research part and the personal narrative part. I have some ideas for how those might go together. Writing about, has anyone to that phase yet? Yeah, Madeline? Oh, that would be so interesting. So where's Waldo? Like you can do like a history of those, like that picture book and you could even look at the writer or the artist or, oh, I love that. That's a great, that's a great example of how to do this. Does anyone else have one that they want to check? Uh, I want to do like the picture one. I want to do picture one. Like, the one oh, cool. <laughs> and do you know what you'll, what you'll combine it with? Yeah, that'll be fun. It'll it could be something I don't know anything about Pokemon actually. So, but it could be it, you could go in a lot of different directions with that. Like you wouldn't have to write the research part about Pokemon. It, it would be even better if it was something totally different. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of gonna talk about so I was talking to like my personal experience of doing like a fossil brother one, and then um, I'm gonna compare it to like you know like fish at the bottom of the ocean where because of like the absence of light it magnifies their other senses. Yes. So it's like and in the absence and loss of something plummeting, it can cause growth and like learn lessons in some other way. Oh, that's going to be incredible. So you get to do some research about a fish at the bottom of the ocean and yeah. sea life. That'll be very cool. I really like that. Okay, so if you're feeling lost about the assignment after hearing these examples, reading her braided essay, does anyone still have questions about what this essay will actually be? So again, when you first turn it in, you're not braiding them yet. They're two separate things and then we'll work on braiding them together. Okay, then it's due October 4th. You've got a while. You've got a while to start working on it. Don't wait till the last minute on this one. It will be so painful. We have um, one day before that, one class period before that where you're starting to workshop it and you're really, you get some time to like perfect it, but you don't wanna wait until that day to actually rate the thing. So get started on it early. Um, and it has to be in by, I forget which date you guys are, October 4th or 5th. Let me look. We got these now. You guys are 8 October 4th. It has to be on October 4th. I don't do late work for this, this first draft, because we do a peer review that day. So if you come to school without it, uh, you don't get any points, and it's 100 points. So basically, if you come to school on October 4th without anything, you fail the class. Like, it's got to be, you got to have this one done. Yes. Um, is October fourth then like a break every day or the two separate ones? The two separate ones. That's like the first draft, October fourth. Yep. Okay. If you're intimidated by this, I've got a I got a piece of writing that I want to read with you. This will be the last thing we do today. So there's this writer named Anne Lamott, 
and she does a lot, she's like a creative writing teacher too. And so she has like a lot of advice for people about how to write. And I also just really like the tone she takes in this essay. You know, some of these topics that people have been bringing up are serious. And then some like Jack's are maybe, well, I don't know, maybe they are, maybe it was very serious for you, but they're a little bit less serious. <laughs> um, and so I want to show you what, you know, what kind of tone to you can take with this playful, but also she's just giving you great advice in this essay about how to start writing your rated essay. So uh, let's do story time for this one. You've got enough reading silently to yourself. I'm going to read this one too. It's yours. Maybe I should have made fewer copies, but I made enough copies for everyone. So you can write on the next one. Okay. The first useful concept is the idea of short assignments. Often when you sit down to write, what you have in mind is an autobiographical novel about your childhood or a play about the immigrant experience or a history of, oh, say, say women. But this is like trying to scale a glacier. It's hard to get your footing and your fingertips get all red and frozen and torn up. Then your mental illness arrive, <laughs> illnesses arrive at the desk, like your sickest, most secretive relative and they pull up chairs in a semicircle around the computer and they try to be quiet, but you know they're there with their weird coppery breath leering at you behind your back. What I do at this point, as the panic mounts and the jungle drums begin beating, and I realize that the well has run dry and that my future is behind me and I'm going to have to get a job, only I'm completely unemployable, is to stop. First, I try to breathe because I'm either sitting there panting like a lap dog or I'm unintentionally making slow asthmatic death rattles. So I just sit there for a minute, breathing slowly, quietly, I let my mind wander. After a moment, I may notice that I'm trying to decide whether or not I'm too old for orthodontia and whether right now would be a good time to make a few calls. And then I start to think about learning to use makeup and how maybe I could find some boyfriend who's not a total and complete fixer upper. And then my life would be totally great and I'd be happy all the time. And then I think about all the people I should have called back before I sat down to work and how I probably I should probably at least check in with my agent and tell him this great idea I have and see if he thinks it's a good idea and see if he thinks I need orthodontia, if that is what he is actually thinking whenever we have lunch together. Then I think about someone I'm really annoyed with or have some financial problem that is driving me crazy and decide that I must resolve this before I get down to today's work. So I become a dog with a chew toy, worrying it for a while, wrestling it to the ground, fling it, flinging it over my shoulder, chasing it, licking it, chewing it, flinging it back over my shoulder. I stop just short of actually barking but all this only takes somewhere between one and two minutes. So I haven't actually wasted that much time. Still, it leaves me winded. I go back to trying to breathe slowly and calmly. And I finally notice the one inch picture frame that I put on my desk to remind me of short assignments. It reminds me that all I have to do is write down as much as I can see through a one inch picture frame. This is all I have to bite off for the time being. All I am going to do right now, for example, is write that one paragraph that sets the story in my hometown in the late fifties when the trains were still running. I am going to paint a picture of it in words on my word processor. Or all I am going to do is to describe the main character the very first time we meet her, when she first walks out the front door and onto the porch. I'm not even going to describe the expression on her face when she first notices the blind dog sitting behind the wheel of her car. Just what I can see through the one inch picture frame, just one paragraph describing this woman in the town where I grew up the first time we encounter her. E.L. Dr. Rowe once said that writing a novel is like driving a car at night. You can see only as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. You don't have to see where you're going. You don't have to see your destination or everything you will pass along the way. You just have to see two or three feet ahead of you. This is right up there with the best advice about writing or life I have ever heard. So after I've completely exhausted myself thinking about the people I most resent in the world and my more arresting financial problems and, of course, the orthodontia, I remember to pick up the one inch picture frame and to figure out a one inch piece of my story to tell. One small scene, one memory, one exchange. I also remember a story that I know, uh, that I know I've told elsewhere, but that over and over helps me to get a grip. 30 years ago, my older brother, who was 10 years old at the time, was trying to get a report on birds written that he'd had three months to write, which was due the next day. That sounds familiar. We were out at our family cabin in Bolinas and he was at the kitchen table close to tears surrounded by binder paper and pencils and unopened books on birds, immobilized by the hugeness of the task ahead. 
Then my father sat down beside him, put his arm around my brother's shoulder and said, bird by bird, buddy, just take it bird by bird. I tell this story again because it usually makes a dent in the tremendous sense of being overwhelmed that my students experience, that's you guys. Sometimes it actually gives them hope and hope, as Chesterton said, is the power of being cheerful in circumstances that we know to be desperate. Writing can be a pretty desperate endeavor because it is about some of our deepest needs, our need to be visible, to be heard, our need to make sense of our lives, to wake up and grow and belong. It is no wonder if we sometimes tend to take ourselves perhaps a bit too seriously. So here's another story I tell often. In the Bill Murray movie Stripes, in which he joins the army, there's a scene that takes place the first night of boot camp, where Murray's platoon is assembled in the barracks. They are supposed to be getting to know their sergeant, played by Warren Oates, and one another. So each man takes a few moments to say a few things about who he is and where he is from. Finally, it is the turn of this incredibly intense, angry guy named Francis. My name is Francis, he says. No one calls me Francis. Anyone calls me Francis, and I'll kill them. And another thing, I don't like to be touched. Anyone here ever tries to touch me? I'll kill them. At which point, Warren Oates jumps in and says, hey, lighten up, Francis. This is not a bad line to have taped to the wall of your office. Say to yourself in the kindest possible way, look, honey, all we're going to do for now is to write a description of the river at sunrise or the young child swimming in the pool at the club or the first time the man sees the woman he will marry. That is all we are going to do for now. We are just going to take this bird by bird, but we are going to finish this one short assignment. Okay, so I find that a little inspirational when I'm going, when I'm having to tackle something longer. And this isn't the longest paper in the world, but it is a big project. I think it's so helpful to think about that one inch picture frame when you're thinking about your big moment, because memory is like a nebulous, like huge thing. Like um, some of these events, it's like going to be really hard to just pinpoint you know, that one moment and describe it in the detail that you need. So use that little picture frame, find the moment that you think, oh, I can tackle this for today and try that out. So you've got 10 minutes for the rest of the class. Um, I'm going to give you this 10 minutes to get started on this assignment. And maybe that just means still brainstorming and trying to figure out what you're gonna do. Um, or maybe it means actually starting to write. Um, I know Chromebooks take forever to get started. So if, this, if you want to handwrite it too, you can do that. Um, but just 10 minutes to actually like commit to something. Okay, does anyone have any questions? All right, cool. Are you excited about this assignment or are you dreading it or somewhere in between? Or just like completely dead today and it's like you're not even in the room. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs>